Welcome to Crossroads. In today's episode, we'll talk about how the United Nations is being accused of helping facilitate mass illegal immigration into the United States, possibly running the largest human trafficking operation ever carried out. Now, the United Nations International Organization for Migration, IOM, which many of you know we've talked about before, is now finally being exposed more broadly. And it turns out that, yes, they get money from the U.S. government, which means it's coming from your tax dollars. And your tax dollars are paying for them to play a key role in assisting people looking to use the amnesty system to gain entry to the United States. And they're also working through numerous NGOs and nonprofits as part of these operations, which your tax dollars are also financing directly. We will talk about it. First off, let me show you this. This is Todd Benzman, senior fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies, explaining on Fox News how the United Nations is involved in running the border crisis. The United Nations, it turns out, is spending hundreds of millions of dollars in cash handouts, food, shelter, something called humanitarian transportation, uh, really every human need that uh, is required to make the long journey through uh, Latin America, Central America, and Mexico. Uh, and who pays the UN? Who, who's the UN's major funder? It's the U.S. taxpayer is paying for this. Now, remember one of the other big accusations coming out. They're getting prepaid debit cards. We're giving them money, or we're not giving them money. The United Nations is using our money. And, of course, the fake news media said that is fake news, fact check, false. Turns out, yes, they're getting prepaid credit cards and cash envelopes, and they're giving these to the illegal aliens, and that's your tax dollars hard at work, folks. New York Post had this. The United Nations just released the 2024 Interagency Coordination Platform for Refugees and Migrants from Venezuela. Remember, this is just about Venezuela. It's bigger than this, so keep in mind, this is just a small piece. And it notes that a planning and budget document for handing out, or handing out $1.6 billion in 17 Latin American countries, and it confirms, finally, that the United Nations, with the helping hands of 248 named non-governmental organizations, the NGOs, is indeed giving debit cards to illegal migrants, funded in large part by U.S. taxpayers. We're paying their, we're, we're paying their travel fees. We are giving them money, and we're not being told we're doing it. And notes that despite the R4V plan, this is the document from the United Nations, titled na Naming Venezuelans as Recipients of This Aid Operation, the document's fine print, the footnote, page 14, paragraph page 43, for instance, says the largesse goes to all nationalities and multiple other nationalities. And notes further in the, in a nutshell, the United Nations and its advocacy partners want to spread $372 million dollars in cash and voucher assistant and multi-purpose cash assistant to 624,300 immigrants who in transit to the United States during 2024. And notes that money is most often handed out, other UN documents show, as prepaid rechargeable debit cards, but also hard cash in envelopes, bank transfers, and mobile transfers the U.S. border-bound travelers can use for whatever they want. Now, remember, folks, I said this in a special feature just you know, a couple years ago. We've been saying this for a long time right here on Crossroads. We were criticized for it. We were called fake news for it. We were accused of spreading disinformation. And guess what? All of it is true. Every single thing we've been talking about has now been proven true. And of course, look, I mean, I was at the U.S.-Mexico border. I was on the Mexico side. You can look at the ground and it's covered with people's discarded ID cards, travel papers with United Nations markings on them, bus tickets, plane tickets, and yes, these prepaid debit cards that they're handing out to the illegal aliens. 
Now, this article continues noting this is only one part of much broader UN hemisphere wide vision that aims to spend $1.59 billion assisting about 3 million people in 17 countries who emigrated from home nations. And keep in mind, that's just their budget for the coming year. That's just their budget for the coming year. And it's worse than this, actually. There were reports coming out because this is about trafficking them to the U.S. United Nations using your tax money, financing all these NGOs, giving cash payments for people to come and illegally enter the United States. They're facilitating it. They're paying for it. They're awarding these people for violating U.S. law. And then once they get here, there's new reports coming out, for example, in Chicago, that the illegal aliens are getting $9,000 a month, at least around that, for various uh, purposes, including, for example, with housing vouchers. Now, back to this story, though. It's been making rounds, folks. The news that the United Nations is running the border crisis using money paid for by U.S. taxpayer dollars uh, this is no longer just something you're going to hear. Maybe, maybe on, I think we were some of the only folks talking about it for a long time. There's a few other sources, but not broadly, right? This was not like uh, something you'd see plastered all over the mainstream media. This is now out there. This is now being better understood, and people are finally reporting on it. Now, part of this is being exposed because the United Nations, well, just outright revealed the programs in its 2024 budget, and people noticed. The document explains how the United Nations has been giving out cash and other forms of assistance to, yes, facilitate mass illegal immigration into the U.S. And look, many of you might remember we exposed this a few years back the special feature that I did, and that was called Border Deception. And we detailed as well how the United Nations is running these operations, one of the main branches being the IOM, International Organization for Migration, how it was paying all the illegal immigrants along the way. And yes, we exposed how U.S. PAC state dollars were a main source for all of it. And you might also remember, again, one of the main United Nations organizations we exposed in particular, which is, again, the International Organization for Migration, or IOM. And remember this name because you're going to be hearing it a lot more now. The IOM is also finally now being outed. Zero Hedge said this. Meet Amy Pope, an open borders advocate, Obama apartheid, and an accomplice of DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. As the UN's Deputy Secretary for Inter of the International Organization of Migration, IOM, the preeminent NGO in the field of migration, she plays an integral role in the illegal alien surge at our southern border. Further in its states, her coronation occurred at the United Nations 87th Assembly, meeting with world leaders on human mobility, quote unquote, to harness the power of migration, quote unquote, where migra migration is a powerful driver to fulfill the UN's agenda 2030 for sustainable development goals. Remember, the United Nations has Agenda 2030, and that includes 17 sustainable development goals, the socialist wish list of all the things they want to change in the world. And they're saying that they need illegal immigrants to do it. They need to bring, it seems, the entire southern hemisphere of the world and flood it into the northern hemisphere, almost entirely into the United States, maybe Canada, and of course into Western Europe. Now, this woman who's the head of the uh, IOM, she's proud to be moving tens of millions of people, it says, from their land of origin to destabilize Western host nations. It notes that IOM aims to work closely with governments and other United Nations agencies to enable resettlement. To achieve that goal, it provides migrants with cash-based interventions, supplies, and transit assistance, in addition to coordinating and managing UN way stations like Las Blancas and Bajo Chiquito camps in Panama. And it notes that because of unprecedented migration, Pope's bold strategic plan is increasing the 2024 budget to $7.9 billion, nearly a three-fold increase over the 2023 budget. Are you getting that? They're going to have three times as much money 
to carry out these operations this coming year, the one we're in right now, as they did last year. And that could possibly mean we're going to see these operations grow threefold right ahead of the American presidential election. And notes further in, we can be sure that the State Department will help fill that void because as it's coming out now, the State Department is financing these operations using our money. Now again, you might be wondering, where is all that money coming from? Well, we now have the answer, our tax dollars. And it turns out they've been shelling it out to pay for the invasion of the United States. And of course, folks, I'll be revealing more on this and talking about the U.S. border crisis and how it's just a giant fake charade. They're pretending to secure the border. They're pretending to deport people. They're playing this big game and they're not telling you what's actually happening. Behind the scenes with it, they're funding it. Behind the scenes with it, they're working hand in hand with the United Nations to carry it out. Behind the scenes, they have used Border Patrol and repurposed it into an organization to just process this flooding of America with illegal aliens from every you know, corner of the earth, it seems. And they're not telling us why they're doing it for some weird reason. They're trying to hide it from us for some weird reason. And anytime someone like myself goes and exposes what they're doing, including, for example, the cash payments, which we now know are real, they try to hide it, they try to cover it up, they try to silence it and censor it and so on, which is, of course, why you should go over to Epic TV for the rest of this episode, because speaking of censorship, they censor me like you wouldn't believe. Uh, I did a document or a special report on this called Border Deception a few years back. Everything we reported on it is now being vindicated. Everything we reported on it is actually ahead of the curve still. You can watch that on Epic TV, epochtv.com, so be sure to check it out. Uh, again, we'll be going into more stories after this. Uh, but again, those of you on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, jump over now to Epic TV for the rest of the episode, and I will see you there. Experts agree, one of the best ways to protect against financial uncertainty is to diversify your portfolio. Learn how physical gold and silver can secure your retirement funds from today's economic challenges with a gold IRA from American Hartford Gold. You can safeguard your wealth with no penalties or taxes when you transfer your current qualifying retirement accounts. Call now and our precious metals specialists will send you a free information kit, no cost or obligation. American Hartford Gold, a trusted industry leader with an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau, has a five-star rating from thousands of happy clients. Whether you are getting physical precious metals in a gold IRA or delivered to your doorstep, we offer only the highest quality gold and silver. For your peace of mind, we also offer a no-fee buyback commitment, a low-price guarantee, along with free shipping and free insurance. So don't wait. Call the number on your screen today and secure your financial future. Welcome back. Now, look, you might be wondering how the United States is financing these illegal migration operations and also just how much money are taxpayers shelling out money to run this invasion of their own country? Well, look, we actually don't know the full amount. It's still not fully out there. But we know the federal government has spent about $20 billion on refugee assistance for these illegal aliens. Open the Books had this. It said, Our auditors at OpenTheBooks.com looked at just one federal office to get an idea of how much spending is going towards accommodating, transporting, and providing migrants with various other services. And also the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR, which is a part of Health and Human Services. Again, this is a branch of the U.S. government. They are carrying out a lot of this, and it says that they're a major vehicle for migrant-related spending. Now, how much money are they getting to help facilitate the illegal migration of the, into the United States? Well, it says Congress appropriated $20 billion in just two years on refugee and entrant assistance. Are you getting that, folks? $20 billion specifically for refugee and entrant assistant. And remember, they're giving all these illegal aliens refugee status, or at least they're on the waiting list for it. It says that last year they published an oversight report on an unaccompanied children program also run by this agency. 
It says up to 85,000 miners were lost, meaning they disappeared after sponsorship with a vetted guardian. Now, the technicality of that is this. The Biden administration, they have separate camps for all the little illegal alien children, people, you know, kids who don't have adults with them. And they have a program where an adult can come in and say, I'll take 10, I'll take 15, I'll take 20 children. And of course, they give them over to these adults. It turns out that some of the houses of the adults they were giving these children to included vacant lots, including houses with multiple, like, you know, 20 kids in them. And of course, nothing to prove these individuals are any way related to the kids, nothing, no follow up, seeing whether the kids are okay, nothing making sure the kids are not being sex trafficked or enslaved or whatever else. In fact, not only that, but if they make two phone calls and they don't get a response, they just give up and the child is deemed lost. They are deemed, <laughs> they're deemed to be just disappeared. Now, it notes further in that the New York Times, of all paid places, found credible allegations of child labor law violations and congressional whistleblowers also detailed large-scale child trafficking. That was last year, right? It says that now our investigation into the agency reveals new oversight. One, billion-dollar spending spikes in the adult refugee programs, and two, potential conflicts of interest between agency leadership and its largest grant recipients. And that in fact, in for, for decades, agency director Robin Dunn Marcos was employed in executive positions by two nonprofit organizations that are among the agency's largest grantees. I should note as well that Alejandro Mayorkas is also being accused of being tied in with one of the Hebrew resettlement organizations, which is one of the largest nonprofits carrying out this illegal you know, mass migration into the U.S. Now, remember also, we're talking about one government office, and this one U.S. government office had $20 billion in two years of your tax money that they're spending to flood this country in a foreign invasion. And again, that's through the Office of Refugee Resettlement under the Department of Health and Human Services. Now, as I exposed to my investigation at the border a while back, a lot of the money to IOM under the United Nations is coming through the U.S. State Department. And so I should note, they're talking about HHS is $20 billion, right, for this. Remember, the U.S. State Department is also giving them a whole lot of money. And so we don't really know the full amount. The money that we're being told about does not include as well what states are having to spend to house and feed and take care of all the illegal aliens. In Chicago now I mentioned that there's a report coming out they're claiming that about $9,000 is being given to the illegal aliens individually each month for housing, child care, food and everything else. And note as well this $20 billion in this one report does also not include the hospital costs. And remember that illegal immigrants, they game the hospital system for free health care because in the U.S., hospitals cannot legally turn people away. And if you're not on the books, there's no way to hold a person financially accountable for any medical costs. And of course, American taxpayers, part, again, the federal government reimburses some of the money for hospitals. But of course, we also have to eat the costs through our premiums, if they're given health care, free health care through maybe California, something like that. And we also, of course, have to eat the costs in our own hospital bills. Now, there's even more on this. There's also an entire network, as I briefly mentioned, of NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and nonprofit organizations that are also involved in helping facilitate the border invasion. And the Biden administration, guess what? is also giving money directly to many of these. And that money, of course, is your money, your tax dollars. Center for Immigration Studies said this. They say a follow-up CIS examination of more than 30 faith-based nonprofits among those UN, United Nations, NGO partners representing Jewish, Lutheran, Seventh-day Adventist, Catholic and non-denominational evangelical organizations shows 
that the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration and the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, have been maintaining, or sorry, mainlining taxpayer funds to these groups, which then distribute them to keep hundreds of thousands of migrants comfortably moving toward illegal U.S. southern border crossings. They are facilitating this using our tax money. One of these examples, they note HIAS, which has come into focus because allegedly Alejandro Mayorkas, the head of DHS, Department of Homeland Security, is tied to it. And notes here that this is a prime example in the self, it's a self-described Jewish American nonprofit organization, and it's in Silver Springs, Maryland. And notes it was incorporated in 1903 as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And notes it has pledged $17.1 million in aid to immigrants in at least seven Latin American nations during 2024. And United Nations RMRP planning documents show this. It notes that in turn that the FY fiscal year 2022, 47% of revenue reported by HIAS, this Hebrew Immigration Service Organization, came as grants from government agencies. In other words, close to 50% of their money is coming from our own government or government agencies in general. And the majority of that money was coming through the State Department. Meaning, yes, as I said many times, the State Department is funding this. But some of this, it notes, also comes from the Department of Homeland Security to this individual organization, which can bring about some problems given that Mayorkas may have some ties to it. It notes this is according to the group's tax filings and to other sources, with the balance coming from a mix of major corporate sponsors and other sources. Further in, it states that UN budget documents, United Nations, federal grant tracking databases, and other public sources show that the State Departments, PRM and USAID, also have poured taxpayer money into at least the other, into at least the other religion-oriented NGOs that CIS, this Center for Immigration Studies, selected for examination including Catholic organizations, Lutheran organizations, and Seventh-day Adventist groups. It says the list of participating NGOs comes from the UN's 2023 to 2024 Regional Refugee and Migrant Response Plan, which lists more than 200 of these groups, notably on page 268 of that document, if you want to have a look. It says the Center for Immigration Studies has exported that list in this a report which you can find as well if you want. And notes that another 20 NGO groups signed on for the coming year 2024, meaning this is getting larger, because remember also there's a threefold increase of the budget for the United Nations side of it through the IOM. And notes that these groups, these new 20, are not yet being identified. But the State Department, it says, and USAID also sent historic volumes of cash to the Latin American Project's main United Nations overseer, which also passed that aid straight to migrants. And now remember, we talked about IOM. There's also the other one, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, as well as, of course, the IOM. It says the State Department's PRM has given IOM, International Organization for Migration at the UN, $1.4 billion in just the last 12 months by far the most on record according to usaspending.gov, a database that tracks federal spending. And folks, we've been telling you all this for a good while now. Again, the special feature, border deception. If you watch that special feature and you see me surprised, it's because you're watching me in the process of uncovering this. Legitimately, I did not know about this before I set out to investigate it. When I was on the ground in Texas and you know, touring the border and went to the Mexico side, I was coming to understand and uncover this. And of course, when we went to the Mexico side and we started finding all the United Nations documents on the ground, you know, we were shocked. Uh, it was not publicly disclosed. This was not publicly known for the most part. There were some reports here and there, but of course they're being called fake news and everything else by ironically the fake news media. And of course, these fake fact checkers were doing everything they could to try to cover it up. Anybody who said any of this stuff that's now coming out was being attacked. And of course, look, again, we uncovered it, we exposed it. 
Every single thing that we said at that time is now being proven true. Every piece of it, UN involvement through two different branches at least, State Department financing, involvement of other U.S. agencies, the deception of the American voters and the American taxpayers, all of this, and of course the NGOs as well, everything we reported has now been proven accurate. Now, more on this with all of this. The full operation, again, wouldn't really be possible if it wasn't for the manipulation of legal loopholes and even with exceptions being made to U.S. laws. The illegal aliens are being given passes to violate American law. They're being given passes to do things you and I cannot do. Much of this is being done, again, the legal exceptions by the Democrats and the Biden administration. You can take just one example of this, what's being done to facilitate the flights, where people being trafficked are able to fly on American Airlines and they don't even have to show ID. New York Post says this, if you're rushing to the airport and forget your photo ID, well, good luck getting allowed on the plane, but many migrants without an acceptable form of identification, according to airport signs, do not need a photo. They get special treatment. It says migrants who have entered the country using President Joe Biden's new CBP, Customs and Border Protection, one app, at least 422,000 people, can fly domestically without a photo ID. It says that a sign posted in Miami International Airport tells these illegal aliens, one, notify the TSA officer that you are a migrant. Two, the TSA, TSA officer will take a photo, which is optional. And so you can tell the TSA officer, don't take my photo for some reason. And then three, if requested, provide your alien identification number or biographic information. What is biographic information? Oh, senor, I come from Guatemala, right? It notes that taking a photo would allow the Transportation Security Administration officer to confirm the person boarding matches the person pictured in the CBP app. But of course, as they note, you can also decline to let them take your photo. It says the airport sign reads, photo capture is voluntary. They say it twice. And the migrant trying to board could be anybody, even a terrorist, for example. And hey, maybe anybody could do it, you know? <laughs> Now look, there's of course even more to it than all of this. Free housing, free medical care, free flights, don't have to show ID. You can tell TSA to not take your photo. You can boss TSA around. You get money coming here, the IOM and the United Nations pay you. You get cash cards, cash envelopes. I mean, geez, everything, right? And there's more. Wait, there's more. At the state level, the illegal aliens, these immigrants, are also being given benefits of free legal representation. You get a free lawyer. And a lot of this also is being paid by American taxpayers. How much money are we paying them? How much money are we paying them? 9000 a month for their houses and childcare, and you know, that doesn't even include schooling, notably, food and everything else at the state level. Uh, 20 billion just to you know run the operations through the NGOs to resettle them. The money, who knows how much we're giving to IOM and the UNHRC. All this money we're giving on all these different ways, and yes, there's more. New York Post says, as a record number of migrants invade the United States, wreaking pain on New York City and other communities, one group is winning big time: the public advocacy lawyers. It says their business is to constantly sue to win more so-called rights for migrants. Rights to shelter, rights to meals, rights to health care, and even the right to vote in local elections. Maybe that's the goal here, right? And who pays the bills on both sides of these lawsuits? Paying for the lawyers, paying for the money the illegal aliens get by winning their lawsuits? Well, you do. It says taxpayer money largely funds these legal combatants, which include the Coalition for the Homeless, Legal Aid Society, and the Vera Institute for Just of Justice. You are paying to be legally coerced into providing more for migrants, even at the cost of cutting vital city services. Because in New York, they say everything's on the table. We can't afford it anymore. The city's going bankrupt. And they're talking about cutting police, 
They're talking about cutting sanitation. They're talking about cutting the education budget for kids, all to pay the bills for the illegal immigrants. Now, further in, it states that the New York City Council this month passed Resolution 556, calling on the state legislature in New York to guarantee as a right that all migrants have lawyers paid for by taxpayers when they go to immigration court. Are you getting that? How many migrants are there? But is it 8 million now, something like that, entering the United States? Now, of course, that's not just in New York, but it says that New York on this would be the first in the nation to guarantee this. And Resolution 556 would give these illegal immigrants more rights than American citizens have. No one else is guaranteed a publicly funded lawyer in civil court matters like, you know, housing court or divorce or something like that. And they say, who's behind this push? Well, in this case, they say the Vera Institute of Justice is one of them. And they note that Vera claims, quote, we need a federally funded universal legal defense service for migrants. And I would say, of course, the lawyers are going to say that because if you have a federally funded budget to keep them working nonstop, that's a lot of money. They say, in short, a national army across the entire United States is what they're pushing for of left wing lawyers paid for by you. <sighs> Now, folks, taken as a whole, the imagery we're watching at the border, the illegal immigrant caravans, the people standing in line and being processed through the openings in the border wall, this is a giant charade. It's a big show. They're pretending to enforce border security. They're telling you they're doing it, and they're lying to you while looking you in the eye. They're looking you in the face, and they're lying to you. This is not a random issue of people just saying, hey, maybe I'll go walk to America today. This is not like that. This is a large-scale international operation being organized, being facilitated, being run, and being paid for by all these operations, United Nations, U.S. government under the Biden administration, and the money they're using to finance it is your money. And at the same time, too, they're bankrolling all these woke, you know, NGOs and all these woke lawyers and all these woke nonprofits, which are getting bank while carrying this out. And again, this is being operated, facilitated, all of it coordinated, and you're not being told it's happening. They're, for some reason, they've been trying to hide it for us, from us. And for some reason as well, the Biden administration... They want the illegal immigrants so badly in the United States. They want it so bad. They're running it. They're not telling you about it. They're lying to you about it. And they want it badly enough that they're willing to bankrupt U.S. states. They're willing to bankrupt New York. They're willing to bankrupt California, willing to bankrupt Chicago, and so on and so on. Willing to make all these narratives saying it's Texas's fault. It's Texas busing people here. They're lying, of course, right? That's not, that's not the real cause of it. But they care about it enough to cause all this damage, and they're not telling us why. They're not telling us why they want it so badly. This is a coordinated and planned operation between our government, between woke organizations, NGOs, uh, lawyers, nonprofits, and yes, the United Nations, our money is being used, our tax dollars, the money is supposed to be going to our schools and our military and, you know, building our roads and providing basic services. They're taking that money away from us and they're spending it on this. And while they're doing it, they're lying to Americans about doing it. They're keeping us in the dark and they're still not telling us why they are doing it. And so I think we need some answers, folks. And, of course, I'll be covering this more going forward, so stay tuned for future coverage. All right, folks, that said, let's jump into some questions. Let's see here. All right. You know, uh, it's, nice, it's nice when we say something for a long time and people say we're spreading false information, and then it's shown to be true. I should note that whether it's the border crisis, whether it's COVID origins, whether it's uh, J6, we haven't had to publish any corrections. Everything we've said, even though we were initially attacked, is proven true over time. And um, it's my theory, right? S speak the truth, even if you're attacked for it. 
and people will understand later, at the very least, uh, that you had it right. Brad Williams, you're saying, guess who the illegal immigrants will be illegally voting for in the USA? Yeah, probably the people giving them free handouts, right? Mm. You know, Dinesh D'Souza made a really good point. If you want to read a good book, read his book, The Big Lie. And it talks, it, it exposes, you know, the communist and, well, the Nazi links of the Democrat Party. And it also goes into the background of how the Democrats were the slave owners. They, they of course, fought for keeping slaves. And, of course, the Union was the Republicans. It talks about how the lie around the big flip where Republicans became Democrats and Re Democrats became Republicans is actually fake. It never happened. And it talks as well about something very important, which is that the leftist agenda works like a criminal ring. And Dinesh, of course, remember he was thrown in jail by, you know, the Obama administration for, for like donating a little bit too much money to a political campaign. It was like not much at all, really. But he was, most, most people get a slap on the wrist for it. They threw Dinesh in prison for it. And while Dinesh was in prison, he came to understand how crime works, right? Hearing the other prisoners and seeing how the, the deals they made when they were planning, you know, robberies, whatever like that. He came to understand how it works, and he's like, you know what, this is interesting, because this is kind of, at least he said, how the Democrats work. What they do is they offer you a kickback. Vote for me, and I'll give you, you know, I'll give you a cut. We'll, we'll go and rob the rich guy, and I'll give you a percentage of that. With the illegal immigration, that's what Democrats are doing. Hey, uh, vote for us, and we'll keep giving you this 9000 bucks a month, $9,000 a month. Vote for us. Well, forgive your student loans, right? You want, you want that money? How much money is that? How much is a student loan? Like 20000 30000 uh, a couple hundred thousand, depending on where you went? That's a lot of money, right? Vote for us. We'll give you $200,000, kid. You know, who are you going to vote for? And, of course, that's the way the, the ring works, the criminal ring. They will take the money from somebody else, U.S. taxpayers um, in this case, and then hand it off to another person saying, hey, uh, you know, you got two choices, 9,000 bucks or you get deported. Who are you going to vote for? Right? And so, yeah, you wonder who they're going to vote for. No way for Trump, uh, you're, or sorry, Norway for Trump, very different. You're saying, I wonder how the illegal invasion can be stopped. Any suggestions? Yes. Uh, enforce the border secure, enforce border laws. Uh, technically, all these people are in violation of American law. All you have to do is enforce our laws. Remember, if you go back to like the late George Bush presidency, it was a crime. It was a federal crime to illegally enter the United States. If you were working at a business, the business could be criminally charged. And so, you know, if, if you knew a business was hiring illegal aliens, you know, you could report them. That was Amer that's American law. Um, I would say that personally, I think the U.S. should demand uh, repayment from the individuals who've come here and taken American tax money. I think that every single person who has gotten nine thousand dollars a month, or however much they uh, paid, you know, were paid while being trafficked here, that they should have to pay that money back. America should hold them financially liable for every single dollar spent on them individually. And I think that would be at least fair, given that they were able to come here and cause the amount of harm they've caused to American cities and the amount of damage they've, they've wrought and, uh, you know, of course, just causing chaos in this country. I think they should be financially liable in addition to being deported for every dollar that we had to spend on them. And at the very least, maybe their countries of origin should be held financially liable for it. Because uh, honestly, even if Trump comes in and Trump's saying, you know, day one we're going to deport everybody, that's going to be a lot of money too. Uh, I would say the countries of origin or maybe the United Nations uh, should be forced to pay into this. The difficult part with this is, of course, you could argue that technically it's a U.S. operation. Technically the Biden administration was bankrolling it. And I understand in these countries, you know, we accuse them, hey guys, uh, you know, you're causing a lot of problems here. They'll be like, it's not us, it's your own government doing it. And, you know, they're, they're partly right on that, frankly. Uh, you know, really, I think maybe we should even look into RICO charges on whether the federal government was 
violating any crimes and every individual who was involved in the carrying out of that crime uh, may be tied in with human trafficking and drug trafficking and every single crime co committed connected to this you know mass wave of millions upon millions of people uh, maybe they should be held legally accountable for that and maybe that could inc include criminal charges um, I, I think that Americans are going to want justice I don't know how that's going to look but I don't think peace can be restored completely to the United States until they see some form of justice served. I don't think the American people will be satisfied if, you know, all these public officials are able to just retire on their pensions and live happily ever after. I think they need to be held legally liable for the harm they've caused to the American people. And as part of that too, maybe the Soros DAs and their loose on crime policies and the murders and the rapes and the robberies that were caused in connection with with those policies i don't know if there's a way to hold them legally accountable for it but i think they should be held legally accountable uh let's see uh Sigrimen, you're saying there have been reports of this for years what is bringing this to the surface only now um for some reason the mainstream media is only now covering it <laughs> So, if you've been watching Crossroads, you would have known this for years. Uh, in fact, I would, I'd say probably a lot of you here have known this for years. And so, yeah, it's been known for years. But, you know, there's a, there's a small handful of journalists who are talking about it. Uh, Center for Immigration Studies, we, we showed you some of the reports. They've been talking about it for a good while. I should not take credit for it. They were on this before I was. Center for Immigration Studies has done fantastic reporting on this, really. Uh, some individuals, um, my friend Michael Yan, a war correspondent and great journalist, has been, of course, working in the Darien Gap in Panama for a long time. And he's been talking about this for a very long time. In fact, in our Border Deception feature, we worked very close with Michael Yan on that. Uh, there have been a handful of, of journalists, but it's mostly independent journalists and folks like myself. I don't know if... Epic Times it could still be called independent. We're, we're not part of the cor corporate infrastructure, but we, we, you know, we're now like the fourth largest newspaper in the U.S., at least by subscription numbers. So. But um, independent in thought, independent in reporting, independent in our ability to say what we want to say without having somebody try to crush it, crush it as long as we can prove it, right? Hmm. Free from outside influences. So I would define independent journalism, and uh, very much so I, I agree with that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's finally coming to light, right? Uh, let's see here. Baroque, uh, Borke 2, you're saying, could you imagine $9,000 a month? Most Americans can only imagine. Our own money given to illegals we worked hard for. Yeah, well, and I'd say actually we're, gonna, we're nearing very soon a breakdown of the agreement we have, the understanding we have with the federal government that, you know, we give our tax money with the belief that doing so will bring benefit to us. It's a mutually beneficial process. The social contract, as Robes was it Rousseau would have called it, the social contract whereby we surrender some of our individual sovereignty to an extent, right, in the form of tax dollars mostly, to an external power structure, government, something we agreed to create among ourselves, in order to get a service in return, protection, the mediation of legal disputes, uh, military, police, courts, and so on, and of course some form of representation to help us in times of crisis, maybe a, sta a grain store or something like that, to make sure that if there's a famine we don't all starve to death. That was the basic structure and form of government. Diplomacy, military, police, courts, and that's about it. Uh, of course, now we've seen the government expand where every part of our lives has a government agency connected to it. And many of these government agencies, I think over time, have stopped benefiting people. And not only that, they become very abusive of the American people. And not only that, but because of globalist policies, we see that our tax money is not even benefiting us anymore. It's going to foreign nationals, it's going to maybe international corruption, it's financing foreign wars, it's uh, being used to bribe officials in countries we can't even find on a map, kind, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff like this. And now we're finding that 
non-citizens are being paid to violate our laws, right? Illegal aliens are being given money to violate our laws. You know, 9,000 bucks a month is a lot of money. That, that's like upper middle class. That's more than most people in this country make. And if you're talking about 9,000 bucks a month, and you know, a lot of people in this country are struggling to make, you know, rent at 1400 or even you know less than that a month you, you have people living a few people do an apartment you know in new york for example and uh, they look and see hey these illegal immigrants are getting this kind of money you know they, they they're going to start having issues with it uh let's see schnuggy you're saying i heard that evergrand that's in china was declared insolvent do you think the ccp will push for war with taiwan to distract from a falling economy yeah, so this is another big topic. I, I haven't covered it because I know I've been saying it for a while. The CCP is going to collapse any day now, right? I, I don't want to keep banging the drum on that. But I do believe it. I believe the CCP is going to collapse any day now. Uh, their economy is crumbling. And Evergrande being... The, Evergrande is kind of the canary in the coal mine. Evergrande is one of the largest real estate companies in China. And I've been saying for a while that it's going to be a domino effect. Evergrande's going to fall and you're going to watch a ripple go through the country of a real estate crisis. Not just me saying that, but a lot of folks saying it. Evergrande was like a zombie company for a long time. It was the living dead. It was dead. It was a dead company. And it was being propped up like, like, uh, like weakened at Bernie's. And, you know, the CCP's like tying strings to its hand to make it be like, come invest in us, foreign investors. <laughs> you know? The whole charade is over. Evergrande is declared insolvent. It is now going down, finally. And you're going you're gonna to now watch the ripple effect of that. About a third of the Chinese economy is in real estate. Uh, now about another third is in manufacturing. The manufacturing is dying also because a lot of companies are pulling out, not only because of COVID, because of the way that you know, Xi Jinping is kind of banging the war drums. Another third is just through random stuff. The Chinese economy is going to rapidly collapse. Uh, remember the way things break down. It's very slowly then very quickly, you know, and the very slowly part is now over. You're going to now watch the very quickly part. Uh, given this situation, it is possible the CCP may try something drastic, maybe launch a war. One thing that's been noted to me in various interviews, and I know as well, is that the Chinese military budget is separate. The CCP, even if the entire economy collapses, will still continue financing its military the same as it always has. And so even if Evergrande collapses, which it is now, even if the entire real estate industry collapses, even if that overflows and destroys the entire manufacturing base and everything else, the Chinese military is still going to have the same budget. And the fighting military capabilities will re remain maybe not totally the same, but relatively the same, at least for the short term. You know, over time, of course, it'll degrade. Uh, but during this window of time, absolutely, it's possible they could try to launch a war. And frankly, the windows of opportunity are very much open right now, considering the many global conflicts, the expanding nature of those conflicts, and also the chaos uh, internationally as people try to push back against woke government and also in the United States where we're going to be distracted with our own elections, not to mention the border crisis, which I, w I personally wonder if, given the UN involvement, if China's involved in that as well. Judy Akeem, you're saying, what do you make of the religious organizations taking part in the immigration process? Socialist corruption making its way into religion, or people establishing fake religious organizations to cover migration facilitation? I'd say probably a bit of both. Um, Keep in mind that if a Luther, if, if, a, if a random guy starts like a Baptist, re, you know, refugee resettlement organization, it doesn't necessarily mean that he represents every single Christian Baptist in America. You know, a Jewish immigration service, it doesn't mean that the entire like world of every Jew on the face of the earth is part of this. Um, just because an individual creates an organization under the name of a religion doesn't mean that every single person in that religion is in on it. You know what I mean? And so, you know, you do have people gaming that. The other side of it, too, is when you create, when you create a religious organization, you're given some degree of religious protection in terms of, you know, legal protection. 
uh, and also when it comes to re uh, creating nonprofits and so on, that, that gives you some additional benefits. So there are there are actual legal legal benefits to creating religious organizations, especially as it comes to taxes. And so they, they could be gaming it for that reason. Mm. The other side of it is, yes, you have had a socialist infiltration of most of the religious infrastructure. You can read the book Disinformation by Ian Mihai Pachepa and read about how the Soviet Union was infiltrating the World Council of Churches. You can talk to people like James Lindsay, who works, of course, with uh, New Discourses. And through some of the organizations he works with closely, they've also exposed, because one of the guys he works closely with was you know, used to be involved with this and actually got out because he was so concerned about what it meant for the future of religion, that there are Chinese Communist Party groups getting into and beginning to alter religious texts, getting into the systems that teach our preachers and so on. And yeah, religion is being subverted. Uh, this goes back a very long way. I would say that most religions, not the entire religions, but factions of it, have been subverted by their own heresies. If you look back into the, 16, the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, of course, you had a very large amount of heretical movements begin. And over the course of time, a lot of those heresies, things that were considered heresy, uh, have overtaken certain denominations of most religions. Just about every religion has had some factions taken over by their own heresies. And so, given this circumstance, it does not mean that religion has become evil. It does not mean that these religious groups are, you know, working with the devil or something like that. Uh, but without a doubt, you have had evil people create structures under the names of some of these organizations. And when I see stuff like this, I just, I just kind of see it as part of that pattern, personally. I see it either as people trying to make money or people part of the heretical factions, uh, you know, maybe may actually trying to be part of this whole thing, one of the two. Mm. And of course, you know, communism has been trying to kill religion and then put on its skin afterwards, like, uh, like Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. Um, you know, the, the Soviet Union did this, the CCP does it. Uh, this, one example, the Chinese Communist Party, they, with, with Buddhism, for example, after they took power, they killed all the priests. They killed all the Buddhist priests. And then they created the China Buddha Association, a Communist Party-run organization, and they planted CCP officials and had them put on the robes of monks and said that it was, the, you know, it, this is Buddhism. It's not. It's a Communist Party religion under the skin of Buddhism. Uh, they did the same thing to many organizations. They did the same thing, the thing to the Catholic Church, uh, notably, you know, within China. And so just because an organization works under the name of a religion does not mean that it represents that religion, I would say. California gal, you're saying, isn't bankrupting the United States part of the plan to take our country over? Color revolution. Illegal immigration helps with this, evidently. Yeah, the other thing is the Cloven-Piven strategy, where you, you, know, you try to bankrupt the U.S. by just creating weight on its social services. Sorry, Cloward-Piven strategy. Um, and yeah, also the risk of color revolution. One of the issues we're going to see is that socialist groups are very likely going to start approaching these illegal immigrants and carrying out what they call uh, community organizing. We need to get the illegal aliens community organized so they can have proper representation. I would argue the taxpayer money paying for their lawyers is going to accomplish that to some degree. Uh, there's also pushes to allow them to form unions, like worker unions, and so they're able to unionize. As soon as they can unionize, they can start pressuring our government and pressuring local governments and, you know, harassing American businesses and everything else. You're, you're going to start seeing all these things. Because it's one thing to have millions upon millions of people living off government handouts. It's another thing. Which, which creates problems in itself as it starts bankrupting the cities and so on, right? And then they have to get more federal money to pay for and normalize that type of social welfare. They're, they're basically creating a giant welfare state. They're, they're creating the infrastructure of total socialism. They're, they're creating it already uh, in order to service the illegal immigrants. They're building it. 
And I don't think that's going to go away even, even if we boot them all out. Uh, the other side of it, though, is, as you mentioned, color revolutions. You're going to start having socialist organizations, maybe just woke organizations, uh, creating you know, community organizing, getting millions upon millions of people signed on, maybe protesting, maybe picketing, and who knows what else, and demanding things. Uh, including probably political change, including voting rights and everything else. And again, you have these woke law firms already that are filing lawsuits using our tax money against our own government in order to change the laws to give new benefits, including the ability to vote to the illegal aliens. And so, yeah, uh, you're witnessing the socialist, a, a, in my opinion, a socialist revolution uh, taking the, taking this disguise under an illegal alien uh, you know, crisis. Jonathan asks, you're saying, Josh, I'm hearing so much news about how bad the economy in China is, but if it's confusing to me to see how much territory they are winning in the rest of the world using their borrowing money scheme. How can you explain that? I've said repeatedly, the Chinese Communist Party would have collapsed already were it not for foreign investment. The lifeblood, the siphoning that is allowing the survival of the CCP is taking place mainly through foreign investment and mainly through, you know, individuals here investing in China and putting our pensions in China and BlackRock and Vanguard and these other big investment firms that have for a very long time been putting massive amounts of money into China. Now, they've been warned to pull out and they're starting to pull out. And I would say given the collapse of Evergrande, and with that, the Chinese real estate industry, uh, you can watch as the financial collapse takes place that you will see a divestment. Um, without a doubt, you're going to be watching this now. Um, the challenge with that is going to be whether they decide to put money back in once it, once it reaches rock bottom. Uh, but uh, we'll see if it can be saved. The CCP might be nearing its end with this, um, although they will remain a danger, at the very least, on the military front. Uh, James Dyson, you're saying, and by the way, we're going to start seeing the ripple effect of that here, especially because a lot of our investment firms and banks and so on uh, also have a lot of money in China because of how they've propped it up, you know. And by the way, that's the nature of any evil system. An evil system is not, is not self-sustainable. An evil system can only work through vampirism. It can only work by sucking the life force out of upright systems. Uh, they can never maintain things themselves. Uh, you can even see this in the nature of criminals. They work through parasit paras you know, parasitism. They're parasites. They, they survive off the wealth and the virtue and the life of others. Uh, they cannot self-sustain. If they were self-sustaining, they would not be called criminals. And when you have criminal regimes, communist regimes, they can only survive so long as they can siphon money out of other people. Uh, socialism works so long as you have people to steal money from, so long as there are people working and paying into the pot, which is then being distributed. And as soon as people start pulling out from that and no longer wanting to participate, that's when you start watching the quality of life in socialist countries begin to dwindle. And as it dwindles lower and lower, the country gets closer and closer to collapse because it no longer has a host to feed on. Socialism is parasitical. It is, a, it is the ideology of parasites. And I would say again that evil in general is like that. Evil needs to survive uh, off of the righteous. It needs to feed off of them. Otherwise it can't sustain itself. And the CCP the same way. Uh, the CCP would have long collapsed were not able to feed off of wealthy nations and fool investors and so on. James Dyson, you're saying, I wonder if deporting all these illegal immigrants will take longer than it did for them to pour into the U.S. Trump's saying very rapidly they're going to do it. Um, Trump's saying day one, and again, take him for his word because he said a lot of things last time. We didn't see it. I would argue the reason we didn't see a lot of it last time was because he had so much pushback from within his own administration, from, you know, even Republicans, from the Democrats especially, he didn't have the backing or support to do most stuff. And a lot of people blame them on the fact that he didn't, he didn't bring in his own cabinet with him. 
2025, right, the 2025 agenda for Trump, um, Heritage Foundation part of that, already has a government in waiting for him to carry out these types of operations. And they're saying very rapidly they want to use the military to run the largest deportation operation ever carried out in American history. America has done mass deportation before, uh, but this is going to be on a much larger scale. All right, folks, that said, uh, tune in tomorrow, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. We'll talk about more great stories and all the, all the wonderful things happening in the world. Uh, but, of course, you know, it's being exposed. It, the truth is coming out. And in my opinion, if you want to know where the hope is, frankly, it's in truth. And yes, sometimes the truth is shocking, but as people become aware of what's taking place, when evil is no longer able to hide its head, uh, people begin to want change. And as they begin to recognize what was taking place, then legal action and other forms of action can take place. And so I do believe that even though we're seeing a lot of wild stuff get exposed, the fact that it's getting exposed shows a shift taking place. So tune in tomorrow, folks, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, where we will talk more about this. That said, thank you so much for being here. Please don't forget to share this episode. And as always, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you.